Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. Today we're going to study uh, evolution and what uh, Charles Darwin, at the time that he proposed his theory, didn't know about things that would be discovered in the future that would affect uh, his theory. So uh, let's begin. Uh, we're just wondering uh, if Charles Darwin had known. Well, what would we know today in biology? Would he have uh, proposed the same theory? That's pretty hard to say, but uh, a lot of scientists are beginning to question and challenge uh, certain key aspects of the evolutionary models. So let's look at some of those things that have been discovered and see. We know that Charles Darwin didn't really write much about the origin of speed of life. But in one, a letter that he wrote to his friend, uh, he speculated that life uh, probably started in a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts and light and heat electricity. And that a uh, protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo a sort of complex shape. So he wrote this, but you know, he had no real evidence for this uh, being possible. <laughs> and in the 50s, uh, scientists had been that the primordial atmosphere was had no oxygen. And it had only reducing gases, hydrogen, ammonia, methane, and water vapor. <laughs> and Stanley Miller uh, tested this by passing an electrical discharge through this uh, reducing gas mixture. And this is sort of a picture here of uh, uh, a simplified version of his apparatus where he, uh, he made some sparks in, in this uh, bulb here and he found that there was some organic uh, amino acids and other organic compounds formed at the bottom here. But evidence today now reveals that uh, the atmosphere was mainly composed of nitrogen, water, and carbon dioxide. So the atmosphere that uh, Stanley Miller assumed is not the way it really was. And this type of a gas mystery does not yield any organic compounds when they uh, run various experiments. And of course, this is a devastating blow to uh, a natural origin of life. So today, most uh, origin of life researchers, they don't think that Miller's experiment really uh, matters. But uh, of course, it's still in textbooks. Uh, so at some point, you know, they may change the textbooks, but people are not really aware of, uh, in the general public, they're not aware that his experiment uh, doesn't really matter. Another issue is that when the researcher runs an experiment, they design and run it in a way, such a way to get a successful reaction. So because they designed it in a specific way, what effect does that have? Uh, and is that highly controlled experiment what the early con uh, Earth conditions would be like? And one researcher said that this is Clement Richard, uh, he said, it's not easy to see what replaced the flasks, the pipettes, and the stir bars of a chemistry lab during prebiotic evolution, let alone the hands of the chemists who performed the manipulation. So here's a, style, a version of just a bunch of steps that uh, they may, some recent researchers may have gone through, and it has to be done in a specific sequence, uh, have to have the right temperature in each one. So. Can this happen in the natural world? We don't know. Uh, it's unlikely probably to happen. Seventy uh, years of research have shown that you mm -hmm. need a. Mm -hmm. They don't have as many like small stops to stop that, right? Do it. During 70 years of research uh, since, you know, 
uh, Miller and performed that experiment, it's been uh, known that somebody, the intelligent agency of the researcher plays a role in uh, transforming the chemicals in the reaction. And Simon Conway Morris, he actually said that many experiments designed to explain one or another step in the origin of life are either of tenuous relevance to any believable prebiotic setting or an involved uh, an experimental rate in which the hand of the researcher becomes for all intents and purposes the hand of God. And this, per this author here is not a Christian as far as I know, and he still notices that there's an issue here. Another issue is uh, that most researchers have thought that there is a prebiotic soup, which is organic compounds in the ocean uh, being randomly uh, put together, and they claim it happened over hundreds of millions of years or even maybe a billion. And after this happened, uh, eventually organic uh, materials combined together to form parts of the cell, and then the cell became alive. And the oldest rock should bear this uh, this residue, but there's no evidence for it. This is something that Don talked in a, uh, about in a previous talk that when life first appeared, uh, it was early and uh, in the history of the Earth, and it was sudden. Uh, the, most biologists think that when the life first life came out about, it would be extremely simple and evolving gradually of becoming more complex over time. We know that life, there's evidence of life appearing 3.8 billion years ago, and that's pretty early in the Earth's history. Because just before this time, the Earth was bombarded by quite a few asteroids and comets, and they vaporized the whole surface and melted the ocean, melted the crust, and vaporized the ocean. But life appeared after this uh, bombardment ended, uh, right when the Earth had cooled <laughs> enough, life was there. So the time from the end of the, uh, the bombardment uh, until life is a very short time, of maybe just a, you know 10 million years. A lot less than the uh, millions of years, the hundreds of millions of years that they thought that for the prebiotic soup. And the first life forms were single cell bacteria, which are cyanobacteria, and they're pretty complex, they're not simple. So, Darwin's idea of chemical evolution in a warm little pond, which other uh, people have taken up. Has not uh, proven to be true. Davies uh, was another author says that many investigators feel uneasy stating in public that the origin of life is a mystery, even though behind closed doors they admit that they are baffled. In 1802, uh, William Paley wrote his book, uh, Natural Theology, where he highlighted the similarities between biological systems and human-made uh, machines. And Paley argued that because uh, a biological system is a machine, that they too must come about uh, via the work of a creator. And he gave an example. He said, if you're walking along the beach and you find a watch on the, on the beach, uh, you just say to yourself, it came about just uh, because of the wind and the waves naturally, or, or is it uh, somebody made the machine that, but it's a machine. So the same way when you look at uh, cells, well, we're not there yet, uh, but you know, Paley or Darwin didn't really understand how truly complex the cell is. And biochemists have discovered that many of the characteristics of uh, living systems are similar to that, uh, to the product of human designers. And there's many examples of molecular uh, level machines. They have drive shafts and camshafts and turbines. 
clamps and lever arms and stators and rotors. And here's an example of the bacterial flagellum, which is basically a uh, an onboard, like a motor on a boat. This thing spins around in a circle, it's a rotary engine, and you know, it has different parts that which are given, you know, similar names to what an electric motor would have. And they and this rotates as far as I understand, I think about a hundred thousand uh RPM. Uh you know, and it's controlled by the bacteria to move and search for food. So, but we know the motors and machines are built by human designers. So, when we see a, a similar machine in a cell, uh, what do we? What should we conclude about their origin? Is it? It seems to imply that it's made by uh, an intelligence, that, just like we are, that we can create motors. And machines. And we know that you know uh, information codes come from a mind randomly. And the DNA in the cell is information to basically run the cell uh, and build a, a new cell from scratch. Information is uh, taken out of the DNA at this bottom section. Converted to RNA, uh, goes sent to a ribosome, which then creates proteins. This is similar to a computer, where you you know retrieve information from your hard drive, uh, do something with it in RAM, and maybe print print something or display something on the screen. And the genetic code also the the DNA has optimally uh, fine tuned rules to help in correcting any errors that are in the DNA when, uh, when you duplicate it. So, and this is optimally at fine tuned, which is not something that would just move out randomly. Now I go to the fossil record. In Darwin's day, the fossil record showed sudden appearances of new species with uh, the absence of transitional forms. This <laughs> picture here shows uh, you know, as you go further down, you go back in time, and it shows different types of uh, animals that lived in each of those areas, but in each of those time periods. This is what you would find in, uh, in the ground. As you dig deep further down, you find uh, this animal. If you go a little bit further up, you find this one, a little bit further up, you find that, and so on. And they existed basically unchanged for millions of years. Until you get to the next level when you know, all of a sudden this other uh, animal appears and then it stays present for uh, many years as well. So you don't really have this gradual change that Darwin would have expected. And because Darwin didn't see what he expected in the, in the fossil record, he thought it was complete, incomplete and must be, uh, uh, wasn't studied uh, enough. But then even after 160 years, because it's been 160 years since uh, he wrote his book, I uh, haven't really seen much of a change in the, in the fossil record. And during, let's go back here. You see that from one level to another, something happened in between one level and the other to cause this, uh, a new species to, to appear. And these are called biological big bangs. And for example, there's the first one would have been uh, 575 million years ago. And up to that point, there was only 1% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's not enough for basically any animal to survive. But uh, there was a point in time when a variety of sponges and jellyfish and other species that appeared and they call that the Avalon explosion. And this happened right after the oxygen level in the atmosphere jumped uh, up to 8%. And then there was another explosion at 539 million years ago called the Cambrian explosion. And at that point, uh, 50 to 80% of all the animal phyla appeared. And phyla are just uh, general form, uh, forms of uh, body shapes. And 
And then the Cambrian explosion happened when the oxygen continued to rise and got to 10%. So in both cases, uh, animals appeared uh, right after there was enough of a rise in oxygen so that those types of animals could survive. And later there was other types of other so-called big bangs where uh, mass, a great number of uh, animals appeared. And each of those happened right after a lot of uh, other animals had gone extinct, which you call mass extinction. Now, as, uh, as far as I know, Darwin was aware of this period, this Cambrian uh, uh, level in the rock layer, but uh, again, he assumed that uh, there would be an answer coming in the future. There are some very few uh, examples of transitional forms. Uh, some paleontologists claim that have found a few of these forms. First one is uh, a sequence where you have this creature that's sort of like a raccoon, and gradually over, over time it becomes a whale. This is a, a fish gradually becoming a land dweller. And then you have feathered dinosaurs becoming birds. But there's a few problems with each of these uh, so called transitional sequences here. These are like sequences where they claim to find a pattern from one animal to the, the first to the last here. And the first problem is that uh, this first one here and the, and the last one only took a million years. Uh, that's, that's kind of a short time considering the age of the earth. And they don't appear in sequential order. They appear at, they existed, at, they coexisted at the same time. And the second and third one, some of these primitive forms here appear after the more advanced ones. So like this, the fish appeared after this land animal here. And this, this species of dinosaur appeared after this type of bird. So this the evidence that they claim is not really that, uh, that convincing. Then we have what's called biological convergence. This is where nearly identical uh, features in a species, in, in totally unrelated species, uh, come about. And here's an example. Uh, you have a bird, a butterfly, and a bat, and they all have wings. They can all fly uh, using slightly different uh, like principles, but they all have a, a wing that is controlled by the, the animal. And they all came about in a totally unrelated species. But this is not something that you would expect from evolution because evolution by definition is a random process and their outcome is unpredictable. So this type of convergence should not really even happen. But there are numerous examples. This is just one example, but there's many, many other examples. And the convergence points to the work of a creator uh, that reuses some of the same designs. Uh, some of you in here are engineers. You know that when you have a certain way of, of building something, you use some of the basic materials and some of the basic structures in other uh, projects, and other things that you build. You don't have you don't have to start from scratch with every single thing that you do. Another uh, issue that Darwin and uh, other people at his time is that they pre presumed that the sun was constantly bright, but it's actually changed according to this graph. You probably uh, most of you have seen this. When the sun uh, first basically uh, started producing energy, its brightness increased really rapidly at the beginning, and then it went down. And this is about a billion years ago. It was at its minimum. And since then, it's gone up in brightness. But 
this is uh, something that would be, you know, really hazardous to light because to go from this minimum up to where it is today, uh, you know, it would dry up all the ocean if the temperature, you know, stayed uh, kept on increasing. And normally, even only a two percent change in the luminosity would cause all light to go extinct. Uh, somebody wants to sign in here. Yeah. <clears throat> so normally, if the sun is brightening like this, the temperature would keep on getting warmer and hotter and hotter until finally, you know, everything would be killed off. But there's four things that happen that kept the temperature constant all the way from the beginning here on to up until present. Uh, silicate uh, carbonate cycle is a cycle that uh, takes carbon from the atmosphere and combines it with, uh, with certain rocks. Uh, and the speed at which that carbon gets buried can be altered by various effects. Uh, plants, as you know, remove carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Mm -hmm. So as plants were introduced, uh, as they spread throughout the whole earth, they absorbed carbon dioxide and added the oxygen. And that's how the oxygen kept on going up. And the earth reflectivity, how much light it reflects back is also uh, changed. So all these processes maintain a constant temperature. But the problem is an evolutionary, a random process, it doesn't know what's going to happen to the sun that it's going to get brighter. So how is it going to compensate for that? Only uh, a mind knows that. Now I get to the origin of humanity. Darwin wrote a book called The Descent of Man in 1871, and he speculated uh, many things about humanity's origin. At that time, there were very few fossils uh, uh, found. One was cro and the other one was Neanderthal. And since then, many other fossils have been found, which appear to create an, uh, you know, a tree of evolution for, uh, from ape to man. But these have not really uh, helped identify a clear pathway. Because each discovery of a new fossil is pretty difficult to fit into whatever pathway you would they have thought of before. And in science, if the theory is valid, we know that new discoveries will make it uh, make it will make sense, but it doesn't in the case of human evolution. Most now interpret these fossils as side branches and dead ends. <clears throat> so how can we say that human evolution is a fact? Darwin thought that there's not much of a difference between us and animals. He said the difference in, uh, in, in time, he was talking about our mind and the, the mind of an animal. And he said that the difference in mind between man and higher animals, great as it is, is certainly one of degree and not of kind. Today, some anthropologists say that the difference is in kind, not just degree. Thomas Suddendorf wrote a book uh, about the gap between us and other animals. And he says that our minds have spawned civilizations and technology that have changed the face of the earth. <clears throat> like of living animals sit un unobtrusively in their remaining forests. There appears to be a tremendous gap between human and animal minds. And as far as I know, he is also not a Christian. So, with these issues that you know I've mentioned and others, uh, why have biologists not abandoned evolution? <clears throat> One is their philosophy, which is methodological naturalism. And this is the viewpoint of most scientists. Uh, they assume that there is no supernatural and no God. But of course, this limits the possible explanations for any theory that they propose. This is an example. This is uh, 
Thomas Kuhn in 1960 something or wrote a book where he uh, looked at the scientific revolutions and how you know you, you have normal science for a few years. Uh, the models that they have have to be updated to sort of fit the facts. And then you get a crisis where the model doesn't seem to fit some new evidence. And you know, one example is uh, <clears throat> before the time of Albert Einstein, there was various facts in physics that we couldn't explain. They didn't understand how it fit. So Albert Einstein came up with a way. So he revolutionized uh, and came up with relativity. <clears throat> so physics was, you know, from Newtonian physics, they went to uh, relativity. Uh, and then he updated that even to general relativity. So this is the cycle of most uh, scientific uh, models. So you have to get to a point where right now, I think when it comes to evolution, we're in this, in this uh, part of the cycle here of crisis, and we need to get to the cycle of a revolution. So you have to, revolution implies uh, proposing a new model. So merely explaining the problems, which is what the crisis phase is, is not enough. You have to propose a new model. So RTB has created a new model. They call it testable creation model. And it's used to make predictions. And it's used to be a stepping stone to be like the next model to replace uh, the evolutionary one. And it makes predictions just like <clears throat> all models. And also over time, the predictions are probably true, then it makes uh, any more credible. And Don talked about this last month. And prediction can also test whether one model is better than another. So for example, naturalism predicts that the convergence that we talked about a few minutes ago should prove to be rare. Well, the RTB model predicts that uh, many more examples will be found. So as a summary, I'm gonna summarize, just tell you some of the things we've talked about, uh, things that Darwin didn't know. He did not know that the atmosphere, uh, the early atmosphere, was not did not have the elements uh, for life to form naturally. Uh, he didn't know that creating organic compounds requires a specific series of steps, which you know are usually set up by a researcher. He didn't know that uh, there's no prebiotic soup, no evidence for it. He didn't know about the late heavy bombardment, which is the uh, all those asteroids and comets that were hitting the Earth and making the uh, all the oceans uh, evaporate. And he didn't know that life appeared suddenly right after that ended. And then when it appeared, uh, it was complex. And when it appeared, that was early in Earth's history. He did not know that the inner workings of a salt contained machines. And he didn't know that cells have DNA, which is an information system. And he didn't know that DNA has optimally designed rules. And when it comes to fossils, uh, he didn't know that after you know 160 years, uh, he still haven't discovered what he expected to be discovered. He didn't know that the Avalon and Cabernet explosions that happened right after the oxygen level in the atmosphere increased. He didn't know that there were only very few transitional forms. He didn't know about numerous examples of convergence. He didn't know that the brightness of the sun uh, has been increasing since, uh, you know, about three and a half billion years ago. And he didn't know that uh, how many fossils don't explain uh, human evolution. And he didn't have known the other. Exceptional, being way different from uh, the animals. Alexander Pope was a poet who lived uh, from the end of the 1600s, the uh, beginning of the 1700s. Uh, in 1711, he wrote a poem. And 
this is what the poem, uh, the first, first few lines of the poem say, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the period spring. Period spring is uh, part of Greek mythology, a place where you can get knowledge. And knowledge. There are shallow droughts, like drinking a little bit, can toxicate the brain, but drinking a lot makes us sober again. That's drinking from the from the well of knowledge. So I think Pope, by to me, would have warned Darwin that there's a danger in proposing a theory before all or most of the facts are known. So here's a resource list that uh, you know you're going to get this in an email in about a week. Uh, you can there's an overview of evolution and some of the issues here uh, done by Buzz Grana. You can get a free copy of this book, What Darwin Didn't Know, uh, which was uh, recently revised uh, by Fuzz and, uh, and Hugh. So you can go to this website and just download your own free copy. And here's some books that you can, uh, we have some of these in the back, right, uh, Jan? Yes, we do. <laughs> so you can get some of those. Uh, this first one here by Michael Denton, he's not a, a believer, as far as I know. So this book it has some of the guy, the whole uh, the paradigm of evolution and what some of the things that are in crisis, but he sort of interprets it interprets it in a different way. But this is still a good way to know what the issues are. Uh, Origin of Life by Fuzz Rana and Hugh Ross, creating life in the lab, the cell design. The cell design is where I think Fuzz talks a lot about. The machines uh, inside the cell, and the uh, R2B creation model is described in this book more than a theory, but it's probably a little bit out of date now. I think this was published like more than ten or twelve years ago. So during that time, uh, they've updated the model. I don't think there's any book uh, that has uh, you know, all the current details. Thank you for tonight for, for this. It's not a long presentation, but uh, a lot of uh, things that, that can help you here. <clears throat> so why don't we take a little break and then we'll come back for any Q&A. <laughs> yes. Let's get together now and have a time of a question and answer. So I'm going to ask the people on the mind first is there anybody that has a question that they want to ask? Well, you, uh, Nobody online, anybody here have a question? Yes. Well, you know, we understand what Darwin said, you know, et cetera. And, and actually, you know, a lot of what he said is is quite reasonable from the evidence, you know, what you see. I mean, it, it's, you know, we started at a human cell, like a bacteria, and then it grew to various animals and all that's over, you know, billions of years. But what would you say God's process was like to say that he instantaneously said, you know, there's going to be a, a plant and there's going to be an animal, and to make each type of thing from scratch is one way of saying that's what God did. But what would you say over like four billion, three and a half billion years of the Earth's history? How was God working to do all these things to change? What, What's the RGB philosophy on what actually happened? And this graph here, when I go back to it, I can find it. <clears throat> See all these different levels here? Right. Mm -hmm. One level to the next. God caused a certain event that would. Uh, make some of the animals go extinct, and then he created new animals, and then he just let them uh, 
you know, multiply and live for, you know, a few million years. And then the next level, he repeated the process. He made the animals go extinct uh, and then created new ones. And this process was repeated, but it was because the, uh, God introduced the animals that were required at that point in time in the Earth's history that will be required later to produce either, uh, you know, the right fossil, the right deposits, so that it, they'd be useful for us. Because everything, a lot of things that we need in our modern society came from, they were dug up in the ground. You know, petroleum comes from uh, dead, dead plants and animals that were buried. Uh, you know, all the constru a lot of construction material was just uh, shells that were deposited on the bottom of the ocean. You know, when you make plaster, you're you're using up uh, the bodies of dead uh, uh, dead shells. Cement is also probably a part of that. Is that right? Does anybody know if that is the which cement it comes from the bio deposits? I think so. Yes, it can. Yeah, of lime and calcium and yeah. So the guy that changed this whole process, uh, and then well, even before this bottom level, it would have been one week. Yeah. yeah. Is there anywhere in the Bible that talks about these extinctions and then new species suddenly arriving? Uh, yes, yeah, Psalm one hundred four. And what does it say? Let me let me find a look it up and tell you exactly what it says. Six days of creation from a whole different perspective. Those days are long periods of time. We can understand it, and it was during those long periods of time that God did His creative work. Um, so the evidence does not point to, um, as Chris said, you know, doing a, a booth. It, it, it was he used the physics that that. He had already created the laws of physics to do much of the work that has resulted in our planet being the way it is. But there were times when there was a absolutely miraculous creative act. And, and we get those from specific Hebrew words where God uses the word bara, for example. So when he made the, the animals, the more advanced animals, that's the, that's the second time we see this word hurrah. And so it leads us to understand that some of the things that we see, God would have used a microevolutionary process. So animals could have changed over time, but not changed into new species. That's what we don't see. What we do see is this sort of instantaneous, geologically speaking, appearance of animals in the fossil record, which points toward God's creative act. Um, what, Bruno's highlighting now is the extinction part of it, because that's something that people tend to see as bad. You know, all we hear, all we hear about is species going extinct, but if they could not go extinct, we wouldn't be here. It's, it's that simple. You know, I agree with what you say. I think that there were many, many millions of instances where God actually changed, like a human embryo, changed the genetics so that the offspring was different slightly different than the parents. And then over a period of time, it became quite different. It's much the same way we, we breed dogs, for example, from wolves. Like, you know, there's all kinds of different dogs. And, and yet they came, we know they came from wolves because they were bred. Sure. And so I think God does a lot of this gradual thing because he seems, if he can do miracles, he can change couple of genes or whatever that's not a big deal yeah. and if he wanted to he could probably just create a brand new species and said bang there it is but i think in general terms god's process was over really long periods of time and he used you know minor changes uh to do so it, it's a little confusing when you say evolution is 100 percent wrong and god created everything from scratch 100 percent. i don't think God did that. I think he, his work looks to us like an evolutionary process, mm -hmm. but he did obviously perform miracles frequently. Yeah, I don't think anyone's saying that there wasn't, you know, God couldn't have used the processes, but the, the, 
the challenge that I would say, Chris, with, with what you just said is that it, it can very easily lead to a complete theistic evolutionary paradigm. In other words, God only used evolutionary processes to get us where we are, which we would disagree with because, well, for two reasons. Um, the first is theological, and that is God says that he did this uniquely, but if you look at the Cambrian explosion, for example, it is not a fully gradual micro evolutionary process that provides 70 phyla that we see in the Cambrian explosion. They appeared in geological terms instantaneously. So even biology, any biologist say knows any what the Cambrian explosion would say it's an absolute mystery. You cannot explain it using any kind of evolutionary model how they all appeared suddenly in the fossil record, but they did. So I always use that as the prima facie argument, or example, I should say, on God's supernatural creative work, um, because they just appear. And 40, like 70 different body shapes, only 40 of them still exist. You know, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, there are many cases where you go from one end, one uh, creature to another, and it's a dramatic difference. It's like serious difference. So it has to be created that way. Sure. Yeah, the challenge with the Camden explosion and Darwin's theory is slow and random, right? Minor, minor, minor changes over hundreds of millions of years in the Camden explosion and the Avalon explosion as well yeah. would, would contradict that. So I think by current biology study, I think there's new theories behind the curve and they talk about you know big bangs of evolution trying to explain. Cambridge explosion. Yeah. And in our point of view and our TV point of view is those are relatively instantaneous and reflect on this work. Well, they're committed to methodological naturalism. So they have to find a natural exactly for exactly. to explain it because that's yeah. the only tool they have in their toolkit. Yeah. Now I think embedded in your question, Chris, is, is a valid question. And and I want to underline it because Christians have a tendency to do this and that as well. You know, we dis, we dis what we see in the natural evolutionary paradigm, but we don't really have a good explanation for how God did something, right? right? And right. I, so I like that you raised that because it's not enough to just say, wow, it, it couldn't be this and, and God's the answer because that's just a classic God of the gaps argument, right? And so right. We're, we're very aware of that in our TV and we, we definitely shy away from yeah. from things that sound or look like God of the gaps. But, you know, at, at the same time, we have to also point out the fact that the, the other side of the argument, the naturalist argument, they have their nature of the gaps arguments. You know, in other words, we can't explain the Cambrian explosion, but we know nature did it somehow. Well, <laughs> that's just the reverse argument without God, right? So, so I think it's better to acknowledge that we have these biases, we're biased toward believing that we can detect God in creation. And here's some examples. They're biased to say, no, nature will explain everything. Okay. As long as you're clear on your biases, at least you can have a conversation. That's what we try and say. And, and I think it is important to underscore their biases as well, because yeah. they tend to focus on the things where they feel comfortable. Like, for example, okay, the evolution, the gradual changes. But okay, how about if we if we start talking about the emergence of life in, in the first place? Right. What about if we start talking about how did the sexes emerge? Right. I've never heard this question. Yeah. But you got you got like two different uh, what uh, cells, and then all of a sudden one becomes uh, cooperating with the other one to create life. I mean, how does this work? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then and then obviously the. Um, uh, the beginning of, of matter and you know the, the big bang and and, and, and all of this um, uh, fine tuning argument right which is I think you don't appreciate it because if, uh, if you throw out you throw the number like okay the probability of this happening by chance is one ten thousand to minus one twenty one is just probably much more right now right <laughs> it's it's like okay what well, big deal I mean yeah. This alone should convince you because there's, it, it means that it's impossible, okay, to to emerge by accident, right? Fair.
And it, we have the, the uh, I mean, we talked about the Cayman explosion and the Avalon, mm -hmm. but each of these extinction and then new life appearing, that's also, those are also explosions because they happen at such a very short time. So it, there's like maybe, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe like 10 different biological uh, big bangs besides the Avalon and the, big, and the Cambrian. Like you had asked about the, the Bible. Uh, Psalm 104, uh, verse 24, it starts, it says, the earth is full of your creatures. And then further down, it says, these are all look to you to give them their food and due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Yeah, so it kind of resembles what you're talking about. Yeah. Up there. Creatures dying off and God's spirit yeah. comes and creates new ones. Great verse. Who had a question? I just you did. ask another question and it kind of, kind of dovetails with Chris's a little bit and a little bit with what we were already talking about. So we go back to the this Kuhn cycle, right? Or the KU thing, HN yeah. cycle. But the model that the kind of or like the model that's been a revised model. So my question is, given that some of the advancements in 2023 and beyond that, that's coming up around, we've moved from the Newtonian age to the, the age of uh, Einstein's uh, theories of relativity and nuclear power to, yeah. to antimatter and advancements, some of the new advancements with development of quote unquote antimatter and energy and whatnot. Um, given the advancements around string theory as opposed to general relativities and the advancements around, um, for instance, um, some of the, you know, quantum compute, compute, computing and whatnot, given these new tools and advancements, has there been any like missing links on both sides of the equation, either it be the general theories around um, evolution or our or, or understanding of creation? Uh, and also a uh, from the point of view of um, like what Hugh Ross's reasons to believe is, are there any pieces we can bring together that help us more from moving into the 2025, 2030 that will help us? If we have these debates, because this makes total sense to us, but if we have like a, a professor from Harvard or Yale here debating the yeah. the evolution side, yeah. what are they saying about this? That are they, are they, we're, we're, we're all good with this, most of us here. Well, uh, the way I see it and the way, uh, you know, this book here that was written by Michael Denton, he titles it Evolution, a Theory uh, Still in Crisis, because he wrote an original one in 1984, first edition, called it Evolution, a Theory in Crisis. And he updated this in 2015, I think, saying that it's still in crisis. So he acknowledges that, uh, according to Kuhn's model, we're still at this stage here, which is model crisis, you know, according to most uh, biologists. But RTB is trying to move us to the next level, the next stage, which is our revolution in the model by producing a different model that agrees uh, more with the, with the evidence. Right. The same way that Einstein produced, okay. you know, the theory of relativity, which explains a lot of uh, what they had discovered at that point and at that time. But you see, my question is like, I understand this, what we're talking about makes total sense, but there's advancements in science, yeah. technology, and astronomy. Like, we have now, like, the Hubble, Hubble, Hubble telescopes full of technology. Now we have James Webb in place. Now, theories around relativity, that's fine, that's a foundation, but now we've got into string theory plus general relativity to understand. Yeah, but that's it. None of those stories really impact biology. And then go into biology, then look at the advancements that Don's dealing with, 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 with. With uh, yeah, the CRISPR and all these new they're technologies. Not, they're not, so to answer your question, I mean, they're not operating, um, they're not worried about quantum levels, for example, or, or any kind of quantum tunneling or any of the stuff that, that you raised, you know, that area of science out of biologic, in the biological system. There, there are maybe a few researchers out there that are interested in that, but they would be quite fringe because most of biochemistry is is basically Newtonian. There is some uh, subatomic behaviors that are well known, but it doesn't, it's when you expand that out and try and explain um, 
a model of evolution of all species on earth, never mind the creation of life in the first place. You know, they, that's that's like they're just not even there. They're not even thinking along those terms because what they're really looking at is by definition, when you get down to subatomic levels, trying to explain phenomena and behaviors, you tend to be working with a system that operates at that level. So that's why quantum computing, for example, is really cool because they understand that the limits on a integrated circuit are purely physical. You can't, there's a limit to how small you can make it. And so Jim could probably talk this better than I can, but at the end of the day, there are quantal phenomena that occur as you go smaller and smaller and smaller, and they're trying to exploit it. They are exploiting it, right? Um, but <clears throat> the overlap, I would say, is, you know, I'm, I'm sure you don't remember from Star Trek um, Voyager, when, when that came out, one of the things they came up with was this concept of gel packs. Do you remember that on the, on the, on the Enterprise? Or on Voyager, the, the starship? They, so this idea was, you had a computer, but then in order to execute the commands, you had you had a, a gel pack, which was basically a bunch of proteins that interacted with the computer. So they were already way ahead of their time, as Star Trek always was, saying that we can use proteins as information molecules in conjunction with computers. Now that's not that's not science fiction anymore. But none of that has anything to do with some of the stuff that you're raising. It's just not at that level. I don't know if that helps you, but so what I would say because in, in, okay. sci in okay. science there's a lot of separation between you know a biologist learns this set of knowledge, a chemist learns, learns this, a physicist yeah. learns that, and they don't really share all the lot between yeah. them. They there, are, there are such phenomena as theoretical biologists that there are, yeah. but they're fringe. But like when I say fringe, I don't mean weird, dumb, like crazy fringe. I mean there it's a fringe area of science. There's just not a lot of interest in it because they're still trying to explain why water boils at exactly 100 degrees C. So if, you, if you're it, say Don, you're the you're like an atheist or you're like a someone doesn't believe in creation, yeah. Right? And you're working in the lab, I'm working in the lab, we're, we're partners. What what are some of the bridge points that we can connect on when I'm trying to share we're, we're trying to we're trying to share faith with you yeah. that we can find common ground with where do we start with this? Because they're not going to jump to our side. We're not going to jump to their side. Where's the bridge in between? Well, I think that biology is offering more and more examples. I mean, in physics, there's a lot more scientists that are kind of there, especially astronomers and astrophysicists. There's many of them that have come to the table. See, mm -hmm. and Hugh and Fuzz are always saying that it's just a question of time that it'll happen in biology. And it's because we keep discovering more and more things that cannot be explained by classical Darwinian thinking. And, and it's acknowledged. There are papers being written in secular journals to say, guys, our model is broken. We can't explain this. Mm -hmm. And if, on a practical level, you talk about being in a lab. I mean, when I was in the lab, it was easy to turn to a colleague and say, gee, you know, when you look at this, do you ever wonder how it got here? Yeah. You know, and of course they go into the usual sort of thing, and then you can challenge them. Say, well, really, you really think that's reasonable? And off you go. You're on having a conversation. It's easy. It's so easy in biology to do that. But it's just that they're stuck in this paradigm of methodological naturalism. It's the only way you're allowed to think. And that's the challenge, I think. Yeah. Behind the curtain, there's there's no Alan who was here before was talking to us biology. and saying that certain yeah. people have a whole yeah. mindset that they have to think a certain way they, because of their upbringing. Yeah. Them yeah. Course, then they currently they told him, Well, you're a Christian, you're a free thinker, but they can't let because you're not limited of the curtain by what you, your upbringing says. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So, I, I'm more and more convinced that the, the the best common ground would be morality and, and you know talking to people about the problems, about what's good, what's evil, and and things, you know, examples in in family, why the family, you know, it's good to raise the family in a certain environment, what the morality in politics, which one is good. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's probably more convincing to people because because you everybody has its internal convictions about okay what's good and what's bad right and, and and if you if you can somehow explore this subject with people some everybody has you know has a family and has uh, convictions about the politics and about the 
uh, about the religions. People can be very sensitive about these subjects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, talking about the, the random and the systematic, uh, you can't build something upon a foundation and it's opposite of what that thing is based on. So if you can't build random upon a foundation that, that is based on systematic, so we're, we're talking about um, it's like something going up and something going down. This this. They're not trying to build a pond. They're trying to build sideways. It's like a if if you're following me here, it's uh. I'm not following what you're. Are you talking about life? They're building it on a false yeah. on a false um paradigm. I think he's he's saying I think that like um, Darwin's theory of relativity is based on on just like a, a hypothesis that does not even near even rationally even close to what. So these models are going divert the diverse models like. Our, our the religious belief model is coming more and more 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 science is revealing things the more it's coming to light this is this is reality around creation but the more things we discover is like based on a false foundation it's like the blocks keep falling out from underneath this there's nothing there it's, it's they got they've got nothing to stand on this are you saying because they're based on a random process as we're built well the random and systematic, systematic are, are opposite of each other so if you're if you're building from a foundation if you're your, if your random is your building and your foundation is systematic, it, it's not going to, it, it doesn't work. Are you follow me? Not exactly. So yeah. the missing links, to the yeah, blocks so are all falling out of the house, missing links, and you get the, the biological models, and they're like, you can't even, all these little molecules even coming together, it's like it, those build blocks fall apart. In the random soup, you know, the foundation just washes out. There's nothing there. So the issue so becomes becomes what, what John mentioned was instead of God of the gaps that the atheists used to complain about yes. Christians, it's science of the gaps. If there's a gap here in knowledge. We'll figure it out in 10, 15, 20, 50 years, whatever it happens to be. That's the explanation. And even the party's about. opposition around their hypothesis are even false. Like, yeah, there's but, nothing there. But see, they... So they, there are many papers being written uh, in journals of evolutionary biology. If you can pick up the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. It's a major journal. You can go and look it up. And there are papers being published in that journal all the time that are challenging the model. That's what they do. And it's it's you don't have to look very hard to find that the scientists that are engaged and would call themselves an evolutionary biologist, they do not agree. And they would never say, we have a watertight, open and shut model that, that answers everything. We, we don't. In you fact, never, so can I correct you, Don? Sorry, you're interrupting. Yeah, they would never say to the general public, because as soon as they do, correct. it opens up yeah. God into the equation. They'll do it within the confines of the paper, academia. Mm -hmm. Lots of challenges, as you said, but they present a very united front uh, on science. Yeah, exactly. What I was going to, yeah, that, what I was going to say was I was going to get to what Jim just said, and, and the, but the reason is because the way science is done is that you, you publish a paper, the paper is challenged, somebody publishes another paper, and that's how it goes. And so the journal is basically like reading the bylaws of an organization. You can see the progression of where they're going. And the progression is to say, we believe we have this basic view, and now we're we're pulling apart, pulling it apart. And there are some major problems. Um, that is not, to Jim's point, not that well known in the, in the general public because they're still committed to naturalism, still committed to methodological naturalism, which basically is the ruling, guiding philosophy of how you do science. Um, so why know, is that? Why do we still teach Darwinian theory in universities and our school systems? Because we don't the opposite of the, of the God equation. That's you know, right. That, that, that. That's, that, that's the answer. Because teachers and profs and everybody that's in the education system is immersed in this thinking. And it's not just in biological sciences, by the way. It's in everything. Yeah. Where are the ideologies because because the elites right? who have the money and they are actually funding these things are committed to, uh, uh, to atheism and they mm -hmm. want to just get rid of God. And that's why they 
according to you know one of the protagonists of communism, Gramsci, right? They they just made this uh, uh, this uh, uh, walk through the institutions, and you know they are successful in it, right? So basically, what we're getting from the schools is the propaganda. Mm -hmm. You have to be you have to understand this is a spiritual war we're taking part in, right? Mm -hmm. Even Darwin himself didn't come to his theory completely neutral, right? Now. He had some experience. If you read the history of Darwin, it's very clear that he had a real issue with religion, with occultism as well. Yeah, and right. so he he didn't come up with his theory in isolation and in a in a completely neutral way. He had it in for <laughs> for theists, and he was trying to come up with an explanation that did not require God. And that's why modern biologists love it so much, because as Darwin said. Or as um, Richard Dawkins said, Darwin allowed me to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And better about my atheism, that's basically what he's saying. And so we, have, we can never divorce this from the philosophical underpinnings of, of how we got where we are. That's, that's, what, that's what Paul talks about to your point on. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse, verse 8, it says, see, that, see to it that no one takes you captive. By philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elementary or rudimentary spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. And that's what they are—the rudimentary, like foundational spirits that have come in and they, they built these structures of underpinnings of ideologies that are really they're they're, they're false in narrative, and but they're, they're philosophical narratives that have that are infiltrated all through our university that used to be the they used to be theological centers. All of our Ivy schools used to be. It used to be seminaries at one point. Now they're all like humanistic uh, schools of thought. And there's no there's, there's a debate going on there. Right. You know, just yeah, being dropped into this. Don't get started. <laughs> just being dropped into this, not listening to Don's previous thing. I am in a current Bible study of Exodus, and we're sitting around this table looking at the details that God is in, the instructions that He gave them. You know. The right finger, seven sprinkles of blood, and just you know, turn their head this way and slaughter this animal, no blemish, this and it sitting listening to your explanation, the details that God has put into creation. He is a God of detail, mm -hmm. and he is a God of excellence and alpha and omega. So he knew at every step of the for me, just dropping in there, and I'm not an engineer and I'm not a biochemist or a scientist, but just someone seeking and believing. His character, the character of God is seen in evolution, that he's a God of details. He's a God of knowledge. He knew exactly, he knows exactly what we need. And so I don't think you can really share the theory of evolution without providing the character of God, which is a God of excellence, a God of detail, and mm -hmm. a God of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to share your faith with somebody trying to explain to them evolution, I think you have to share them first the character of God and that yeah. he is a God of detail and he's yeah. a God of excellence. Especially when John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the word, the yeah. word, and yeah. the word was with God and the word yeah. was God. Yeah. When you drill down to like the like what Don's dealing with day by day on yes. this, and the DNA level of information, yeah. that's like the word, not even, not even, Darwin didn't have any clue about that. Yeah. And yet it's just creates everything. And he wasn't he wasn't a man of excellence because he has holes in his his theories. He what? He's not a god. He, Darwin wasn't a man of excellence because there's holes in his theory. Yeah. And anybody wouldn't a man of excellence and integrity wouldn't publish something with holes in it. Well, I think at that time that's the point of this yeah. This presentation and Jackie is that there are holes that he didn't really have. So it's yeah. fair to him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the throw bone of Darwin is that. The, the science is, is that you, you pick it, you set it a hypothesis, you want to prove it. So yeah. it's going to be parts that you don't really know, you're not sure of. But yeah, it's pretty big bone. Yes. <laughs> like, in a sense, all science progresses by you know, proposing a model and, and you, you don't really have all, you never have all the evidence, yeah. but you propose a, a model that fits what you know at the time. But you have to be willing, when new evidence comes, you got to be willing to change it. Yeah. I think the other thing that is important to keep in mind is. That there are, there are two primary philosophical outcomings of naturalism versus creation. So, if naturalism is true, 
then it's a lot harder to explain the intangibles of life. You know, Jackie was explaining this earlier, you know, love and, and morality. Jan mentioned it. Um, it, it. You can't be right and wrong if life began from inorganic matter. It's just, I mean, it's a meaningless statement. Whereas um, love and kindness and goodness and all of the morality that we, we understand can come from a personal creator. So I think those are, that's another way to approach this. And, and it's not to diss the person who's, who believes in evolution. It's just to point out that in a gentle way that, you know, you don't have any trouble explaining why there's goodness and love and kindness and, and all of the things that, that, that we love about our world. Um, but the naturalist has a real hard time explaining it because it's just arbitrary. Right? Could I interject? Please. Go ahead. Um, Hi, uh, hello. A couple of points. Uh, first of all, regarding Darwin, I think, to be fair, uh, he, I believe he, one of the chapters in his uh, Origin of Species was all the ways that his um, theory could be disproven. He was, he was a good scientist, but obviously his knowledge at the, he worked with the knowledge that he had at the time. And he saw the, the consequences of, he, of his theory and it really perturbed him. Uh, there was a letter that he wrote, uh, I forget the hooker, I think, to somebody, to a friend, uh, and his, uh, he was saying he had nightmares about how, what's the meaning of the thoughts in my mind if my mind descends from an ape, from a monkey, right? And so, so he, he, he saw the consequences of his, um, of his um, theory, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butchering the quote. Uh, and the other thing is, I've heard that at the end of his life, he was complaining that he no longer could enjoy poetry, he no longer could enjoy music, because it lost all, all meaning for him, because it's just, you know, the result of random developments uh, that produced it, right? So, so he realized that his his uh, theory had consequences, but he couldn't get away from what he thought was the evidence. So that was one point. Uh, I wanted to to uh, to mention that uh, there's a novella called I Darwin uh, that was actually um, they. They did it into kind of a, a radio theater kind of thing. Uh, Darwin visits the 21st century. So it's kind of a fictitious approach to what we're talking about today. So Darwin comes to the 21st century by some, some miracle and uh, interacts with the science and is blown away. And uh, I think he tries to communicate with, with his great great grandchildren or something. But anyway, it's a interesting uh, approach to the same type of information that we're dealing with here. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is Simon Conway Morris is actually a, an Anglican. So he's a Christian, but he is a, a theistic evolutionist. Um, RTB actually had him on for creation updates on February 24th, 2005. So he's kind of a friend of RTB, even though he doesn't believe in the same way regarding creation, obviously. And the other last comment that I wanted to make is that when, when we are talking to people that, that have a scientific background in biology and so forth, we have to try to agree in terms of the terms that we're using. Because uh, for, for them, convergence was a problem, but no longer is a problem. Transitional fossils have been redefined so that 
they don't have to be in in sequential order chronologically. So when you say there's no such thing as a transitional fossil, they'll say, of course there is. But what they're talking about and what you're talking about are two different things. A transitional uh, fossil for a paleontologist now only means that they share certain parts like, like mosaics. So you can see a transition between one fossil and another, but it doesn't mean that one is earlier and the other one is older. They could be contemporaneous or they could be out of order. So just some things to keep in mind is the terminology is, uh, is confusing. For a layman, we think one thing and for somebody that has a, a deeper knowledge, they actually don't think the same way. Even the term human for us means uh, homo sapiens sapiens, just like us. And for uh, uh, anthropologists, it would mean what we would say is a hominin. A any, any hominin, a Neanderthal, an Australopithecus, or whichever, all those other uh, hominins, they're humans. So they're talking about two different things. When we say human and when they say human, so that those are just some some points that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Homer. If I if I could add one, sorry, Andrew. It's okay. Uh, one thing that hasn't come up, uh, I think Don mentioned it uh, quickly. These concepts of microevolution and macroevolution, and microevolution being natural selection. That's part of the uh, theory of evolution. It's not just random processes over hundreds of millions of years. It's natural selection as part of that. And of course, natural selection does work. I think you mentioned the dogs uh, genetic. That's not, that's microevolution. It's a very uh, specific thing to changing as well as other changes in the genes, but not um, speciation changing. You know, a leg doesn't become an ear, or a leg doesn't become an eyeball, or anything like that. It's just a leg becomes a different kind of leg. And I think people get confused about that because they see microevolution, natural selection all the time, dogs and works. So they just apply it to the macro evolution. The, the, the issue I think really is the view of macro evolution uh, and, and those kind of changes that we're talking about. Because natural selection is something that works and everybody is aware of and, and nobody, would, nobody would argue uh, uh, natural selection is working, working in our world today or in the past, right? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a good example right now. If you watch the news, um, they've been reporting for the last couple of days on the fact that we don't have enough antibiotics. That the, the pharmaceutical companies aren't making antibiotics fast enough, and we're getting more and more drug-resistant microbes out there, and it's a real worry. And of course, COVID has caused everybody to get worried about this kind of thing. And but. I've known about this for decades. It's just a fact because there's no money in it. Nobody wants to put the telling and doing the antibiotics. But it, the problem is that, that the bacteria and the and the viruses that are have been treated with the traditional antibiotics that we have, most notably penicillin, have evolved resistance mechanisms. So that it doesn't work anymore. So whereas you used to give somebody a dose of penicillin back in the whatever, 70s, worked great. It doesn't work anymore on those same bugs. Why? Because they've changed, they've adapted. They have naturally selected uh, them in that population and they, not by their choice, but just by virtue of being hit with antibiotics all the time. And, and all of a sudden we have a world where well, a lot of these bacteria have evolved mechanisms that protect them from the attack of the antibiotics that we give them. So it's a, it is a very real concern. And, and uh, the explanation is microevolution, natural selection. That's how we got it. Having grown up on a farm with an agapanisha, there were certainly uh, sprays that we used. I grew up uh, doing spraying just about every day. There were sprays that came out that killed some of the instant, uh, insects instantaneously. And also the farmers that's they used the spray that a lot of farmers died because the spray was so poisonous. And then after a point, uh, uh, point in time, these sprays were no longer effective. The farmers didn't die anymore. So 
that was the end of that then to adapt to new forms of control of these diseases. Yeah. Well, wasn't that Jacob with the goats uh, and the spots, the, the white coats and the spotted coats? Yeah, yeah that's natural. So that's uh, certainly aware of it back then. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd just like to say that, you know, I think we all take a lot of things for granted, but if you had to go to a lab and create one molecule to start from beginning to make life and, and to make us human beings, like one more, basically our DNA and, and you know, chromosomes and all it's one, essentially one molecule, then look at what it can do. It can produce babies and, and teenagers and adults and personalities and teeth and it goes on and on. It's like you have to have a designer to be able to develop one molecule that can become all that we are. The the immensity of, of the human um, you know genome is is unbelievable. John, how many uh, genes are in uh, our spread DNA? Twenty six genes. Well, Twenty thousand genes. Well, Twenty six yeah, chromosomes. chromosomes but... No, but. Uh... Is that the total? Not only twenty six thousand? No, no. There's, there's, there's only about twenty thousand genes that are. You have to be careful how you define a gene, but protein generating DNA okay. segments. Let's call it that. But what about the uh, the DNA that controls uh, turns the genes on and off? Those aren't genes. So they're not. Genes. Me how many genes there are? So I asked. <laughs> well, each. You didn't ask me how many control mechanisms there are for the genes. That's mm -hmm. way more. Each, okay. Each gene can be multi task tasks it can produce many different proteins in different areas and things like that and whatever so so there are thousands of things that are going on not just 20 individual genes that produce all the things that we we require yeah. so it is extremely complex but what i'm saying is if you really understood all the different things that happen from this you know gene or whatever um you know it, it's so complex that we don't even understand a fraction of it today, how the brain works, how this works, and everything else, it's, it's beyond us. You have to have a designer because you can't just happen, you know, by chance, by random, because it's it's so unbelievably complex what the human uh, and, and animals too. Yeah. It, it's um immense. Yeah, it's complex, but the, the, the issue is the biologists would say, well, we just don't understand it yet, but we will. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is, it is comparatively simple. If you want to go from a disorganized matter to an organized systematic matter, you just use a filter. And the filter is, is, is an intelligent, intelligently designed thing. So no matter what you do, you have to, you have to design it, right? Yeah. Right. Well, just to play devil's advocate, the filter in the materialistic world would be natural selection. So I'm just, I'm just being the devil's advocate. Not, I mean, natural selection has to right. be a designed filter. If it's not designed, it's not going to work. As an engineer, I can guarantee that. <laughs> Go ahead. There's a new term in the world of science now called something out of nothing. Right? <laughs> something out of nothing. Have you heard this? There's a new term in the world of science called something out of nothing. Oh. Okay. If you have matter and antimatter and you bring them together, what happens? They, uh, they annihilate energy. each other. They annihilate each other become energy. They become nothing. No, they become... Uh, Where's that energy go? The they energy become nothing. They, they eliminate each other. Is that okay, yeah. Yeah. There comes a warp drive, man. <laughs> okay. so, so if you separate them... You just can't mix it cool. <laughs> so if you got to change the laws of physics. <laughs> so if you separate them, they become something. You have matter and you have antimatter. Okay, so then that comes from the quantum world, right? Mm -hmm. This is what a lot of scientists are using now to explain the emergence of a universe. This comes out mm -hmm. of this quantum world. Mm -hmm. Now, if God controls, if God controls the quantum world, which we assume he does, Maybe that's how we can account for the sudden appearance of something as simple as or as complex as uh, a, a bacteria cell. Because we're saying, how does it come about? 
Well, scientists, it's common now for them to say something out of nothing in the quantum world, that something can appear here, appear somewhere else. You've heard some of these terms, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it, to answer some of these questions, we can look at that. Now, scientists are saying it, it's a product of nature, right. there's something out of nothing. Yeah, but, but they're only saying it's at a, at a quantum level, right? Because uh, well, a particle will come out of nothing. So not a whole system level. of everything. All okay, but if so, God is in control of the quantum world, we're wondering how molecule, you're stumbling across this idea of, of a molecule, and then the molecule becomes something else or contains a lot of this or that. But is it possible that, like I say, science is using this term a lot now, mm -hmm. something out of nothing? Yeah. That's common now. You hear that? There's actually a program on TV called Infinity. Yeah. Heard that one? Yeah. There used to be one, How the Universe Works. And there were several episodes on that. Well, the new one now that's, that's out is this Infinity one. And they're using this something out of nothing uh, as a foundation for explaining how the universe right. can come out of nothing. But we, but Christians can, all, can say, okay, we can use that too. If God's in control of, of creation, and how does a molecule just kind of appear, or how does a human being appear that didn't come from apes or Neanderthals or anything else, and it might be over a period of time, you know, like you said, the laws of physics, et cetera. But the laws of physics, there's a, a set of laws that work on the quantum level, too. So if God is in control sense. of that, which we have to assume as Christians, then some of these things can come about, these species that suddenly appear in the Cambrian ex explosion. Where do they come from? You know, there's this whole quantum world that we don't really fully understand, but scientists are certainly working on it. Yeah, and the thing is, what's coming out of it is organized and machine-like and looks, it indicates a creator. But it could be that that's, that accounts for a, a lot of these things that we're stumbling with. So my understanding of quantum theory is nobody understands it, including the people studying it. <laughs> And some of the theory is there, isn't it? It's there. I mean, okay, because they, they can do experiments and stuff. And, and some of the theories that are coming out of it are now that there's multiple big bangs coming out of whatever the quantum mechanics are. So, trying to, so God is not in that equation with these guys talking about no. quantum physics. I think they're just physics. all of this, Andrew, is just, push, they're just pushing it back further and further back to avoid the God question because we can say. I don't you think know, it like it's the God question at all. Well, what you're saying is that we can, we can, we can, what you're doing though is you're, you're yeah. going to say, you're going to turn around and you're going to say, well, all of that's something out of nothing we call God. And they're going, okay, but you said that about the forms at just a biological level. So all I'm saying to you is that they can go back further and further. Like they can't explain. So let's take the creation of the universe as the example because Jim brought that up. So <laughs> the, the universe. Most most uh, scientists would agree now that the universe had a had a moment in time creation. Okay? all the evidence points to it. There's very few very few uh, scientists that believe that the universe um, has been is eternal. Yeah, something out of nothing. That's right. So something out of nothing. So yeah. so 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 we're saying from our perspective that the 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 hot big bang creation event has all the hallmarks of intelligence. And we yeah. point to all the different things that the various laws of physics that had to be exactly right. All the knobs had to be turned just the right way. All the parameters of physics had to be just so otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? Yeah. The, the anthropic principle. So their way around that is to say, well, you know, there could have been all kinds of universes pop into existence by, you know, through this kind of mechanism. And it's all theoretical. It's mathematics as to how they do that. And it's not through any scientific, there's zero scientific evidence for this. Zero. Nor uh, so it's all theoretical. No, nor approval. But it's designed, it's designed to avoid the obvious, which is we are committed to methodological naturalism. We can't explain how a universe, never mind a bacteria or a molecule, we can't explain how a universe can just suddenly 
come into existence in a moment in time 13.7 billion years ago. We can't explain it. So how are we going to get around this? Well, we're going to, because we're sure as hell not going to admit to God. So they go, all right, well, we'll just come up with a multiverse theory, because that that just that just tells that gets rid of all those theists in one fell swoop. Well, it doesn't. All it does is it pushes the problem back further. And that's I guess what I was trying to say is this idea that you 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 just told us about is pushing it back. So I agree that it's it's a great opening for us to use, mm -hmm. but it's not a new one, it's just all it's done is push it back further. And now their fine tuning just has to go up by many magnitudes. Because yeah. well, you can have a multiverse, fine. It, it, it's still um it doesn't look like an accident. If if you take one of those universes, which happens to be ours, and it looks incredibly organized, it still goes against. The chances. No, that's not the argument because if you have multiverses, they're they're not infinite. infinite. No, that's what they are. And so it can the be chances of a perfect scientists say that there's no such thing as infinity in nature. And whenever they find an infinity in their in their explanations or their formulas, they say there must be something wrong with that. So I I, I can't argue uh, that point. I, um, but pieces I've read about multiverses is this just happens to be one of the multiverses in existence. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But there still is a limited number of multiverses. There a limited number of universes. Yeah. But my argument is the multiverse is really simple. It's like, okay, let's say I agree with you. Let's say there's a hundred thousand universes. A really small number. By the way, I don't think that. No, I know you don't. <laughs> but let's just do there's a hundred thousand universes. Okay. You can't explain the physics of this universe. I agree. How on earth are you going to explain a hundred thousand more? Well, especially, other, since, might... especially since you don't know what the physics of those universes are. They might fail. Because they don't exist. Because they might, you have no they might fail to produce light. Well, that's but ridiculous. This one did. Yeah. There is one where Don is an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> It's sorry, Don. I had to say it. To the Star Trek button, but think about it for a minute. In 1965, they came up with the dual universe episode with two Spocks and two Kirks and all this. It was brilliant. It was a point episode. Before anybody had ever imagined this idea of a parallel universe, never mind multiverses. I love Star Trek. You know, that's one question that we really all have. And then we all believe, well, I'm sure all of us believe that there is a God and that God created the universe just like that. And he didn't lose any of his energy or wisdom or, you know, whatever. He stayed the same. And yet he created out of virtually nothing, a complete universe. And, and we don't know the answer. How did God do that? What? And, and that, brings up, that brings up a good point because the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. And when it comes when it talks about understanding in the Bible, it says the knowledge of holy is un the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's under understanding is all that is universally understood. So that is only known by God. Sure. We yeah. don't have it from a from a human perspective to know that. So I mean, all this understanding of humanity, it's 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 become so um divisive and, and and so many directions because it's not foundational based on the bible what we're doing what we're doing here we we debate it we we understand it from a biblical perspective and it gives us a deeper than they'll ever get out in in, in the way they're trying to yeah. look at things yeah. sure. God, God is one of the wonderful things of the scripture is that God tells us to investigate. He's given us minds to create us as a way to look at his creation and wonder, and we can examine it. He's not afraid. God is not afraid. So, and it just brings us to deeper levels of worship. That's why I love science, because it, it makes me worship God at an ever increasing deeper level. Um, it's not that we're seeking knowledge to become. God, we're just being good creatures the way He created us, right? But 
when you're an atheist or an agnostic scientist, you are not giving God the glory. And so you're you're really running around with blinkers on your eyes. And, and it's sad, really, it's sad because the, the wonder that should come from science is lost if you're not pursuing it from a from a theistic perspective. I understand. And that's how the science started in Europe, because uh, all the scientists looking at the world, they they were Christian for most of them, and so they saw the way to bring glory to God. Yeah, or at least theists. Yeah, that's right. And I look at look at what King Solomon said, uh, and how wise he was. He said, "It is the honor of kings to search out a matter." Yeah, to search out a matter. That's cool. But he, but knowledge without wisdom is dangerous. You really need wisdom along with knowledge. Well, well, and he was the most wisdom important. is applied understanding and to apply understanding it has to come from god because right. only god yeah. has that go, only god has that understanding yeah i felt what he said about darwin that gentleman online when he said that at the end of his life darwin was tormented and that he was Saddened, he put he had no joy. I mean, it's not to just describe that he's totally under attack by the enemy, right? Kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah. He killed, steal, and destroyed that man's life because he was had him focused on such a theory, right? Well, look at Nietzsche. Exactly. Okay, guys, it's uh, almost nine o'clock. I think we're gonna stop here and we'll uh, meet together again next month. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.